Well, welcome everybody to this uh, webinar on the collaboration opportunities for environmental risk assessment. I'm, I'm very happy with this, this webinar, with this uh, event. I'd like to first thank the organizers, Johan and Jens, for organizing this. Um, I think it's, uh, it's good to have these interactions between projects and potential for interaction between projects. So I'm really happy with this. Um, the program, I see, yep. Yeah. Um, for the afternoon, the agenda is, is, is like this. Um, well, there will be some presentations of the underlying project, Cyber and Polymera. Um, Johan will introduce Park. Um, there will be uh, time for questions and answers, hopefully, answers. Um, that we can provide you with. And then after the break, we'll have uh, collaboration opportunities um, and external inputs that we need for the projects. And so the, we are really seeking for interactions with um, all kinds of different stakeholders. And then there will be a wrap up in the end. Um, that's with my name, but um, you have to put no circumstances. I won't be there, but I'm sure that James can uh, take care of that. So thank you. One of the first questions, of course, is why a webinar? Why would we like to find uh, to seek collaboration? Uh, I think there's a, um, a lot of reasons for that. Um, there's quite a few projects that are working on system-based risk assessment. Uh, so that's, uh, and, and I think it's, we think oh, that it's uh, better to join forces to make sure that we link the expertise, that we link the knowledge that we all have, uh, but also that we don't over our stakeholders from the different projects, but that we do that in a, an aligned and structured way to make best use of everybody's time and resources and knowledge. Um, it's also good, I think, to improve visibility and enhance the project so that we have this collaboration. So that's also very important. Um, and that will make sure that we have the biggest impact as possible to ensure regulatory relevance, uh, interactions, and so on. So that is uh, the background of this webinar. Um, we've had a lot of um, um, events and activities before this, of course, but I think it's good to have this in a, in a broader and dedicated context as this webinar. Um, and the last point, and that is really important to, to stress here, that there is a real desire to extend these collaborations from our project, but from all the projects. So that is, um, important to realize this is not something that we do because we have to do it, this is something that we want to do. And I think that's, uh, yeah, for, at least for us, important to realize. Um, as always, some housekeeping notes uh, for, for, for a meeting like this. Uh, we'll have a, a chat function um, and please include your questions there throughout the webinar so they will be addressed at a specific uh, time point. Um, we won't be able to have a interaction uh, during the presentations that uh, is difficult in this format um, so and people will monitor the chat and uh, will address your questions during the q &A. if you do have any technical issues also include that in the chat um, that's i think difficult if the chat is the technical difficulty but we'll try our best to assist you um, and um, the webinar is being recorded i hope you all agree to that and will be made available Okay, let's get started. First, um, I'll present some uh, aspects of one of the projects that is underlying this, uh, this uh, uh, webinar, and that is uh, CyberEG, or CyberEG, depends on how you want to uh, name it, and that is uh, System-Based Environmental Risk Assessment. Um, CyberEG is a, um, um, a project we started um, earlier this year, the 1st of uh, January, in the uh, call of, uh, Horizon call on biodiversity. Um, and we have a lot of um, stake, uh, partners involved from different countries. I won't name them all, but the logos are here. Um, and this is a really good group to, uh, to work with. Um, there's uh, academia, there's regulators, so there's different uh, people with different backgrounds. Uh, we work all together in this in this project. Um, we have a few objectives, and I think it's it's really key to make them clear uh, from the start. And 
one of the things, uh, first thing is, of course, that we want to develop an understanding of chemical impacts on biodiversity and ecosystem service. We think that is the basis of what we need to do. Um, and for that, we need to create knowledge and understanding on the roots of environmental release. Where do the chemicals come from? Where do they go? And how do they uh, impact um, organisms, species, biodiversity? And we need to increase our knowledge under different environmental uh, uh, conditions and contexts. While doing that, we want to develop new methods to establish these routes and faith pathways, uh, and also uh, to establish and identify impact. And uh, based on that, we want to uh, assess chemical risks um, and they are uh, on effect-based approaches. We also include mixture effects, and that is one of the things that is um, quite a challenge as well. To link the different aspects of this, uh, these different approaches, we also include development of models. Um, and with that, we want to link the chemical and toxicity, but also um, further uh, go towards biodiversity and ecosystem services. And we'd like to model that in a relevant, in the relevant environmental context. And then one part, and that's, this is uh, this is a uh, part of that is of course to identify and communicate the measures, but also communicate it to a wider audience, and that includes different stakeholders of different, with different backgrounds. We have a concept uh, that we work from, um, and this is how we see, <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, uh, the, the air, uh, environmental risk assessment of chemicals by now and now, and that is done chemical by chemical. But it's also done in regulatory silo. So the invertebrates, non target articles are different from aquatic, that is different from uh, of, of, of isolated from terrestrial, more or less. The wildlife is, is in a different silo as well. So these different regulatory silos are defined for a reason. Historically, we think they are now in the way um, and preventing or making it difficult to, to go towards a um, biodiversity. Uh, protection. Um, and what we need to do is um, they don't communicate and what we would like to do is to integrate those uh, silos that they talk to each other and that they um, um, all build towards a system-based environmental risk assessment and this is the concept that we are um, trying to uh, move forward in, in, in cyber -right. We have a specific approach <clears throat> Um, we have different work packages, and I'll come to back. I'll come back to the different specific work packages in a minute. But we have work package two that here, and we have defined a few case studies in that that we they work on the different conditions, uh, but all towards uh, um, the ass assessment of chemical risks in, in 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 real life, and that connects to the modeling work package. And the, they both integrate into what we call a risk assessment work package. On top, we have the stakeholder engagement, that's work package one, at the bottom, communication, that it's at the bottom, it's not, uh, that we don't think it's important, but it's just the way you, you present it, but um, those are extremely important work packages, I think, because that's our outreach to the um, outer world, um, and this is all um, considered in uh, to, 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 to provide scientific underpinning uh, to system-based era. And we do realize that we talk about um, proofs of concepts within the project, um, but um, we also realize that we will not be able to change regulation um, um, during the project. And this is all, um, and, and that's what we want to deliver, is input to these discussions on uh, changes um, in, in system towards system-based risk assessment. And that is in concurrence with the other projects, and that is the reason why we have this um, uh, this webinar and the need to, um, to co uh, cooperate our um, efforts with other projects. This is the team, at least part of the team. Uh, we have six work packages, uh, stakeholder consultation, case studies, modeling, risk assessment, communication, and project management. And these are the people that are doing, um, at least leading the work packages, uh, some of which are here, James, and the pressure on work package one, Manuel, work package two, Louise Wipfler, and three, 
so that uh, John Axelman is uh, working on work package four and Coach is on your on five, and I am trying to manage the project. We have Dave Spurgeon um, as an over, overarching work package coordinator, and that is because we think the interactions between work packages is key within the project, and that is the reason why we dedicated um, uh, Dave for that. So case studies, I'm not going to present all case studies because we have a lot of them, but I just want to pick out two. Uh, and one is um, um, uh, is on um, um, oh, I'll, I'll present six, um, uh, just by title. Uh, so we work on uh, uh, plant protection products and winter cereals, both in Spain and UK under different conditions, but the same questions and see whether the conditions are actually driving different uh, risks. Uh, we have a link between aquatic and terrestrial environment in, in Spain. Uh, we have a, a, we're working on a migratory bird, and we do that in Wageningen. It's on godwits migrating from uh, the Netherlands to, to uh, Africa and back. Um, and how do we, we need to deal with the chemicals along the migratory route? Um, case 4 is on multiple chemicals, so it's mixed with toxicity within the system. Uh, and case 35 is uh, on the effects on plant protection product and biodiversity, soil biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. The last one, case 36, is done in the Netherlands, and that is about um, uh, dispersal of um, um, uh, plant protection products in nature protected area, longer range. So that is also important. So if you look at case 31 uh, in the UK and Spain, plant protection products and the first thing we did is make proper descriptions of these um, uh, case studies and the reason for doing that is that with this with these kind of descriptions we could reach out to stakeholders we could reach out to the local uh, land managers to see what we were trying to um, um, uh, trying to do and uh, what the studies and what the objectives are that, what the, of the studies were and then align that with their management and align that with their objectives of, the, of their um, uh, areas. So we have study ob objectives, and this is uh, per case study is different. We also have a site description. Um, here we work on Hope Farm, and Hope Farm is a very good case study because it has a history of interactions with, um, uh, with, with scientists. So that is great. And there's a lot of um, information already existing. So we don't need to do all the work by ourselves. It's great if there is data existing, and this case study already has a lot of data available so that is that is really um, helpful for us this descriptions of these cases really, really help us to interact with the local and uh, regional uh, stakeholders so these are the proposed actions that we want to do and we also defined the stakeholders that are uh, were involved are involved in this um, case study. so we have farmers and farm managers we have local conservation um, um, uh, organizations uh, but also national uh, uh, conservation organizations. Another case study is um, on the Gottwitz um, and uh, looking at effects across spatial scales during uh, migration. This, of course, has different um, objectives. Um, so we had a, a, a case study uh, described and the objectives described and also the sites and the sites are of course different sites along the uh, migration route and this really helped us to identify stakeholders along the route of migration as well so there is a lot of existing information based on uh, work done by the university of Groningen, which would, uh, we, we co uh, cooperate quite a bit and we have different proposed actions um, on explosion effect assessment and biodiversity monitoring Slightly different, of course, than to the whole farm through the other case study because the objectives of the studies are different. This helped us also to identify different stakeholders. Um, um, one of them is University of Groningen and another NGO because they, they have a lot of data and interest, but they also have farmers along the migratory route, industry local, agronomists, and nature conservationists. So this also helped us to um, interact with stakeholders quite a bit. Some of the case studies um, interact with work package three on modeling, and that is uh, uh, three tasks. Uh, 3.1 is a release of uh, so the fate um, um, uh, modeling, and we have uh, uh, tasks on TKTD, so the internal um, uh, modeling of the 
uh, exposure within the within the organisms and then to the individual and then from food web to uh, um, from, from individuals to biodiversity and food web so that's uh, the um, highest tier or highest level of the modeling um, what we want to do is uh, as, uh, get specific proof of concept for different case studies um, and, and provide real case outlook so see what 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 can be done under um, regulatory perspectives as well which i think is is important and again this is not uh, this, this is used to as input for discussions on development of further um, uh, risk assessment uh, guidance this is another uh, aspect of cyber which is quite important um, this is of course stakeholder um, participation in environmental risk assessment there's two uh, work packages on that work package one is actually related to the stakeholder participation interaction the work package four is on risk assessment but that is of course the, the, these two are quite uh, interlinked um, one of the prime objectives of this is that we want to link local stakeholders at the case study level with the high level stakeholders at the eu we think uh, they're all within their own decision context and they need to be able to uh, learn from each other what is the, dif uh, the, the differences in decision context locally and eu-wide and how can we interact and help each other the other thing and that's this uh, of this webinar of course uh, a good example for is aligned with other projects and also with bar so within cybrec we want to uh, develop a multi-stakeholder forum and they could interact with case study working groups and the case study working group are being developed at the moment at the level of case study and then maybe they can feed into the multi-stakeholder forum and with, with actions like we have today and this multi-stakeholder forum we would like to have people we need people from science but from policy but also um, co-develop with farmers and environmental uh, conservation organizations and perhaps industry um, so we need all kind of different inputs from a different level from local to, to you wide to uh, to make this multi-stakeholder forum efficient but also um, uh, successful the objectives of work package four on risk assessment is is is, is important and uh, we all will come back to that later i think um, first of all, we need to reach understanding of critical terms. What do we mean by system-based risk assessment? And does a, a European level um, stakeholder mean the same as local? We need to have that understanding. Um, and we may need to make a, a glossary of critical terms. So we need we, we know what we're talking about. And then the next step is to use this understanding to increase the system understanding. What do we mean? Um, how do we want to move forward? And so on. Um, what is the decision content from different actors? Um, and then we get more and more into the content on key chemicals, what are the drivers, what are the species at risk, and so on. So that is something that is uh, zooming in from uh, uh, um, the critical terms to uh, the actual um, implementation. Um, and it's all focused, and that is one of the biggest objectives of overarching objectives of CyberEC, of course, is to have a fire on the group system-based um, risk assessment thank you that is for now um, I, 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 I'm sure there will be questions in the Q&A session um, but uh, we'll hear of that later thank you I'll stop sharing my screen okay I think uh, Linnea will take over now. Great. Yes, I will start to share my screen. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. 
and it's in the presentation mode, just to clarify. Okay, uh, right. Sorry, give me a second. I have now. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Yes, my name's James Williams. I'm from Aarhus University. Um, for this presentation, I am representing Polynera, um, which is another Horizon Europe project. And uh, as you can see by the uh, title of the slide, what uh, Polynera is looking to do is develop a one system framework for a systems based uh, risk assessment of pollinators. So it's a different focus to CyberAC and uh, it focuses on pollinators and it's also related to uh, the risk assessment of plant protection products, PPPs or pesticides. Um, you, I am also part of the CyberAC uh, consortium, but for this presentation, I will run through the, uh, I'll give you a brief overview of Pollinera and what it's trying to achieve. But I'll first start with a few facts about the ambition and size of the project. It's 48 months um, in duration, and it started on the 1st of January 2024. It's funded by the um, European Commission, uh, Horizon Europe, um, and it was uh, for 5.5 5 million euros. There's 70, uh, 791 person ones, 42 deliverables, 32 milestones, four specific objectives and eight key exploiter results and 14 key performance indicators. So it really is an ambitious project um, and a large project to that. And I will start by giving you an idea by introducing the consortium and let you know who we are. So the consortium is made up of 12 partners in eight different countries and Polynera as a project is bringing together a pool of experts from diverse realms of expertise and knowledge. It's a multidisciplinary consortium um, to help it to collaborate and advance ERA for insect pollinators. So you can see here there are a quite a number of organizations, um, academic as well as regulatory and also communication experts here with different expertise from toxicology, um, uh, pollinator ecology, toxicological testing, modeling, as well as um, uh, social science and humanities involved in stakeholder engagement. So uh, there's a, a broad and diverse set of skills here that are employed in this project. Just to give you a little bit of background on the project and um, why it was initiated, and this will also give an idea on what it's aiming to achieve. So. Uh, the challenge in our view is there are limitations of the current pes uh, pesticide risk assessment, assessing single product and single use to protect pollinators. In the past, the focus has been on honeybees um, that represent this functional group, but it, as a social bee, it does not share some of the other species uh, characteristics and species biology and ecological traits of other species. However, EFSA and the revised EFSA bee guidance does seek to extend the risk of assessments beyond honeybees, including bumblebees and solitary bees um, uh, for plant protection products. And this is something we want to complement um, and uh, also are working towards that we extend this as well. Um, so as you'll see, our aim is to uh, develop a holistic evaluation of risk, uh, risk and impacts of pesticide, of the risk and impacts of pesticides, along with suggestions for mitigation, which incorporates other pollinator species, and and that uh, enables them to be ecologically consistent and uh, assessments of the effects of plant protection products on in, on insects, pollinators more broadly. So what is our approach? Well, to achieve this aim, um, we are aiming to develop a new systems-based environmental risk assessment scheme. And this is not a, 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 it's an extension of what is the current framework, but advancing it in, um, uh, in a way that we're considering as a, what we call a one systems framework. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's developing tools and protocols for a broad range of test, test, toxicological testing, feeding into in silico models, such as uh, QSARS, TK, TD, and also um, population modelings. And uh, this is what we want to incorporate and take these advances and developments um, 
in, in uh, incremental steps within the existing framework and uh, using strong stakeholder um, engagement and co-development approach to gain input to, to ensure that these advances and developments um, are of uh, regulatory relevance and of use. Uh, what we're aiming for, as I mentioned earlier, is this one system framework for risk assessment and policy evaluation that includes an international long-term monitoring scheme for pollinators and pesticides. So we have four specific objectives, and I will uh, briefly run through these to give you an idea of, uh, of how uh, our objectives are different to that of CyberAct, slightly different, but they also do align in some aspects. Again, the focus is on pollinators. So um, we aim to fulfill uh, the ecotoxicological data gaps to enable realistic prediction of the impact of pesticides on pollinators, their sensitivity and responsiveness to mixtures and also routes of exposure. And we aim to achieve this by the identification of pesticide sources and routes and levels of exposure, as well as um, measures of acute and chronic uh, inter interactive effects uh, of um, uh, pesticides on pollinators. The second objective is to develop and test co-monitoring schemes for pesticides and pollinators, um, uh, where we are looking at different cropping systems and also landscapes and developing the uh, risk indicators to enable us to provide uh, exposure information and, uh, and risk indicators for these different cropping systems and landscapes. Um, we'll achieve this by the creation of, a, as we said, a, a long-term international, um, oops, sorry, I'll just go back again, long-term, um, uh, monitoring scheme, uh, which will be a prototype. Um, but again, this will through development, uh, uh, through engagement with various stakeholders, uh, we hope it will be, uh, we intend it to be something that will be um, uh, realistic to achieve and also usable. And we'll also develop protocols that will be shared um, through open science uh, platforms such as the Pollinator Hub. Our third objective is to develop models for predicting pesticide to toxicological effects on pollinators for chemicals and organisms um, and improve the toxic toxicokinetic and toxicodynamic TKTD um, population models and also to help us uh, predict um, environmental, better predict uh, environmental fate of pesticides. Um, we'll as part of this, this will be achieved by developing and enhancing a variety of in silico models to ensure these are um, such as QSAR and T TKTD, as well as population models as well, and also simulation um, uh, system simulation models. But the key part of this is also that all of these developments will be as part of um, uh, open science practices, good open science practices, making use of portals such as uh, the uh, Vega Hub and also open science journals, as well as code being available on GitLab as well. So it really is the intention for this, uh, for our outputs of the project to be uh, transparent and as part of an open science um, policy. Uh, our last objective is to develop a population level uh, systems-based approach to risk and policy assessment, considering multiple stresses and long-term spatial and temporal dynamics. And this is quite an advancement um, that we think it would be very beneficial in um, uh, environmental risk assessment for pesticides. Uh, so this is uh, taking it at a landscape cell and to generate, uh, and along with this, we are, uh, intend to generate an open database for pollinator and pesticide uh, data related to uh, usage, uh, uh, sorry, to you know, the risks, and also a variety of tools that will help um, uh, decision makers improve their decisions so they can uh, look at the, uh, assess the risks thoroughly. Um, we'll do this providing predictive uh, ERA tools, what we're going to, I'll describe what we're calling the one system framework. And um, uh, this will be uh, co-developed and reality checked and also benchmarked as well to ensure that, uh, that what we are developing, it helps to improve uh, our understanding of the system and the risks that are posed by uh, 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 pesticides. 
Um, once developed, the framework and data will be uh, documented, apprised, uh, open access. So again, there's a strong emphasis here on um, uh, open science. So the one system framework, what do we mean by this? Uh, the one system framework builds on uh, the recent roadmap for action of ERA uh, for chemicals of insect pollinators, which was developed within uh, a, a previous project called IPOLERA, and that was funded by the European uh, Food Safety Authority. Our framework will expand the ERA tools currently used for honeybees to include wild bees, butterflies, moths, and hoverflies. And we'll also uh, consider the impact of pollen exposure to multiple chemicals, uh, and as part of that, we'll also incorporate long-term co-monitoring scheme for pollinators and pesticides. Uh, in developing these tools and protocols, or we'll also develop tools and protocols for a broad range of toxicological testing that feed into multiple in silico models, as I mentioned previously, or QSR and TKTD, as well as um, the ALMAS agent-based uh, population uh, uh, simulation system. Um, some of you might have heard that, but if you want to learn more, you can also visit the Polynera um, website, and there are there are further details about the project there. Um, uh, what we aim for this framework it will help evaluate and mitigate usage and impacts of uh, plant protection products, pesticides that are influenced by multiple policies. It's not just uh, the 1107. Um, <clears throat> uh, concerning the placement of uh, plant protection products on the market. It's also sustainable use uh, of uh, PPP's directive, as well as the common agricultural policy, as well as um, taking into account the varying landscape concepts where these chemicals are used. So uh, we uh, think this would be a, a, a significant advance in helping the uh, evaluation of, um, uh, and the impact of uh, uh, plant protection products there. So uh, this is what we're aiming to achieve. It is uh, a uh, uh, an ambitious target, um, but we uh, think it is uh, achievable working in um, collaboration with other projects and also um, with stakeholders. So a core element of our uh, ambition here is to have this core element of this one system framework is collaboration engagement and stakeholder engagement you can see in the uh, the 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 uh, what we have here is in this uh, yellow ring that surrounds the one system framework um, is that we want to ensure that we are engaging the right people when we're developing these methods and protocols and tools that are um, so that they are scientifically underpinned and fit for purpose. Um, some of the project outputs may not be ready for immediate uptake use by the uh, regulatory system. However, through the stakeholder engagement, we'll ensure that they are relevant and useful. And we, what we hope is this will increase the prospect of adoption as well. Um, this does require, uh, as, you, as sort of we're inferring here, engagement and collaboration with other projects. And you can see here, we already identified that there are a number of other uh, projects and we'll come on to talk about those collaborations uh, a little more in, later on in the afternoon. Um, uh, the other projects, as well as a variety of stakeholders. Um, and uh, this engagement today is required uh, with other projects to improve our common understanding of um, some of the challenges that we're facing. And, and also, as Nico mentioned, critical terms and what are the various decision contexts that are uh, um, that are being, uh, uh, that are aware, decision context where people are having to make decisions about the authorization and usage of pesticides. And this, these, um, by aligning our research approaches, what we hoped is to fulfill some of the knowledge gaps and minimize the overlaps between projects. And with engagement of stakeholders, we need to better understand the crucial decision context and what is needed to help make better decisions regarding the approval and usage of uh, plant protection products. So the uh, overall aim of this one system approach is to better protect pollinators and reduce the impacts of pesticides. So those are the, the concept and the overall aims of the project. I will, uh, won't go through all the work packages. There are quite a number because um, we're uh, relatively uh, short of time. It's a short presentation to give you an overview. 
but I will just uh, list the work packages and um, run uh, and uh, give you an idea of um, who is leading each work packet. So we have uh, seven work packages in total, and um, there are a number of um, uh, experts and scientists that are leading these. So we have um, uh, Fabio here, Emilio, Andreas Fox, Maya Randolph, Xiaodong Duan, and uh, Theodore uh, Metodev, who is from uh, Pensoft, and they're experts in the communication. And uh, unfortunately, Chris Topping, Christopher Topping can't join us today. He is the project coordinator and um, uh, project coordinator as also leading the project management. Um, but if you do want to get in contact with any of the work package leaders, uh, we would welcome that. But if you could um, uh, contact Chris and uh, uh, using his email address, that would be the, uh, the route to get in contact with some of these. If there are particular work packages you're interested, you can also visit the uh, Polonera website to uh, understand what is happening within the work packages and what work they're actually doing. So if you're interested, do go visit the Apollinero uh, website there. So what are the expected results uh, from uh, our research activity and engagement activities? Uh, I will uh, run through those. Um, yes, the project aims to develop, as I sort of mentioned before, a, new, uh, a variety of new and improved methods. Um, so there's uh, pesticide testing protocols for non-PB pollinators, a co-monitoring scheme, the development of uh, cumulative assessment groups, development of in silico models, also for novel pesticides and mixtures. Uh, we also want to improve our, uh, and build our knowledge on sources of, and routes of exposure, pollinator sensitivity, and also to support the development of TKTD modeling for chronic tox toxicity testing, and also testing of sublethal effects for not only single uh, chemicals, but also multiple chemicals. And then we'll also uh, div um, bring all this knowledge and improvements into an ERA tools, uh, tool set, an environmental risk assessment tool set that can be used by uh, regulatory authorities. And that includes um, population and landscape modeling, um, as well as the development of environmental scenarios uh, for authorization purposes. Um, but it will also extend the focal organisms uh, as well. Uh, as we said, we're looking at a, a variety of non-bee pollinators. Um, and there'll also be uh, within this uh, risk indicators based on the cumulative risk, uh, toxic load, and also the initial identification of harmful pesticides. All of this then will be available through uh, open science uh, and curated uh, resources. And there are a number of those that we'll be uh, linking to. So the vision for Polonera is to create uh, this uh, one system framework um, and uh, where assessments should be ecologically risk realistic, take into account a variety of contexts. They should account for multiple stressors and it should link monitoring and modeling. And it should also take advantage of new advances and state of art tools. Often these are uh, perceived to be complex, but they are, um, but what we want to do is ensure that um, maybe they are, uh, uh, they can be complex, but they are robust and trusted and also user friendly. So um, developing these uh, new um, modeling tools, uh, particularly population modeling uh, tools, um, is to ensure that uh, everything went through the development is open and ensures that these, uh, uh, modeling tools are, are robust and trusted so and, and developing um, simple interfaces to make them user friendly. So this is uh, part of what we see as the work that we need to achieve to deliver this one system approach. So what are the outcomes um, that we're aiming for as part of uh, the uh, Polynera project? Yeah. So we really want to um, exploit uh, the uh, knowledge and improve the knowledge um, throughout the uh, 48 months of the project. So we want to get a better understanding of pollinator and pesticide interactions and the predictive toxicolo 
toxicology used to support the risk assessment policy um, and also improve uh, our knowledge of the science uh, that uh, by filling data gaps as well on pollinator ecotoxicology and, the, and as well as the methods um, of provision, uh, providing methods uh, for future development. So uh, the results of these will also feed into other projects and we'll talk about uh, this in more detail a little later on. So there's uh, the park and also the biodiversa. Um, this is going to form the basis for a tool for ranking pesticides based on risk and we think this is going to be a significant advancement and uh, the uh, usage of uh, the tools and the different methods and the protocols to uh, advance uh, environmental risk assessment uh, for uh, in, for uh, plant protection products. As I've mentioned, um, uh, we will uh, ensure that, uh, that we follow good open science practices and provide open access to toxicological and risk assessment data, the methods, and also the in silico tools, in silico tools that are being developed. And uh, we envisage these being available through the ESSA Knowledge Junction, also through uh, JRC Knowledge Centers, GitLab, and also available in the EU Pollinator Hub. So there are a variety of uh, sources, uh, a variety of resources that we'll be using to ensure that there's open access. So finally, and a part of what we're really trying to uh, achieve with this webinar today is to uh, look at collaboration opportunities and to ensure that we can maximize on the synergies between um, projects as well, and also partnerships with, uh, and, uh, with other stakeholders and collaborations with other stakeholders. So um, uh, Polonira has a sister project called Wild Posh, and we have been uh, working in close collaboration with them now for a little while. Uh, we share a similar impression to provide better understanding of the exposure routes and the toxicological effects and, uh, and, and ecological impacts of chemicals pollution. Uh, for Polonira, it's related to uh, pesticides. Um, but we also want to extend our collaborations and develop uh, alliances. Uh, we developed an, uh, a collaborative alliance with Cybrac and Park. Um, uh, and what we hope by developing these collaborations is that we will uh, be better address this complex challenge um, for advancing the environmental risk assessment of uh, pesticides uh, in the from the perspective of um, uh, Polonira, but it's uh, advancing it um, in terms of um, developing this one system framework. And uh, we think that uh, these collaborations can enhance our research effort, um, align our research and engagement activities to ensure that um, there's regulatory relevance and uptake of the new approaches and tools that we're proposing. We don't see these as uh, these will be taking incremental steps most often. We said that we uh, uh, proof of concepts. Um, so these, some of these uh, developments will be proof of concepts. Some of them will be also um, uh, uh, advances on existing uh, methods and protocols already there. But uh, it will be through this interaction, we hope that these will be, uh, be able to taken up in the regulatory system. So we're not only intending to uh, uh, interact with projects but also there's a key uh, part of this which is, uh, part of the work that we're doing is which is engagement with a broad and uh, variety of stakeholders. So that was an overview of the Polonira project. Um, if you want to follow uh, developments please uh, you can look on the uh, Polonira website. We also have a LinkedIn page and there is also um, a number of uh, yeah, uh, social media, well, social media platform that we'll be using, which is um, uh, X for that. So uh, yeah, please do follow us. I will, that is the end. I will stop sharing now. And I think then we can hand over to Johan. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Good. Then I will share my presentation as well.
So. <laughs> can you see the presentation, James? I can indeed. Yeah, it's in. Uh... Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, my name is uh, Johan Axelman, uh, as uh, mentioned by James and, and no, not by James, <laughs> but uh, Nico. I'm also involved in CyberAct. Uh, and it happens that I'm also involved in Polinera. But today I will uh, speak on uh, behalf of being the activity leader for an activity in Park. Was it, uh, Park was also mentioned by uh, both James and Nico. And this activity consists of five projects that I will outline a little bit. Uh, and the title of it is Risk Assessment to Support and Promote Efficient Overall Protection of Biodiversity. So, First, some background, what is PARC, for those of you who don't know it. It's an, a partnership uh, for the assessment of risk from chemicals. It's a quite huge endeavor. It uh, lasts for seven years. We're into the third year now. It consists of 200 partners and the total budget is 400 million euros. And uh, one of the strengths with it is that it's precisely that, a partnership, which means that it is co-funded by the partners in the different, uh, in the EU and Horizon Europe. This kind of creates a commitment uh, from all the partners to contribute to the objective work overall. And we also have a very good representation from regulatory, uh, from the regulatory side, because PARC is about uh, updating and improving the regulatory risk assessment, both for human health and for the environment. So, and PARC aims to develop the next generation chemical risk assessment to protect both human health and the environment and support the European Union's chemical strategy and uh, the Green Deal zero pollution and with new data, knowledge, method, tools, expertise, and networks. So uh, collaboration is also part, an inherent part in, in PARC. And this context that it provides is, is a good opportunity because we uh, working in PARC, we also have access to uh, processes and channels to get the feedback and guidance from uh, in the European uh, regulatory system. Uh, we were, where is activity 644? Uh, and I was mentioning work package two and work package three about building uh, synergies and creating a common science policy agenda. There are projects in work package two that uh, uh, are dedicated to create roadmaps for the next generation environmental risk assessment. There are roles of coordination within PARC to, to link the projects within PARC and externally into uh, such work with uh, paving the way for a next generation environmental risk assessment. So it makes good sense to be connected not only to PARC but also within PARC and that's what we have tried to achieve in PARC uh, being activity uh, an activity leader and work package leaders. Um, so in uh, work activity 644 resides in work package 6, which is one of the main, main work packages as its innovation in regulatory risk assessment. And there we have four different tasks and uh, activity 644 is within task 64, which is about transposing results to risk assessment methodologies. And there, in there, we, uh, you see now there's quite a lot of hierarchy in PARC. We have our activity to develop ERA to support and promote efficient overall protection of risk uh, biodiversity. I outline this just to, uh, to illustrate the strength of being connected to a regulatory system through this uh, uh, through this uh, program or partnership, as we are also uh, work packages working with implementation and uh, with uh, ensuring fair data, for example. But now I will be more focused on the links uh, and the actual work in 644, and which also provides the links uh, and possible collaborations to Polinera and CyberRack. So the objectives of PARC 644 specifically is to advance environmental risk assessment of plant protection products. We use plant protection products uh, as a pilot case because it's data rich and it provides uh, opportunities to really learn from all the data that by integrating it the, and all the existing data. Short term, the objective is to update and modernize, uh, modernize the uh, environmental risk 
risk assessment operating within the current ERA framework that is an objective overall of in park to ensure that uh, we take small steps and actually uh, ensure regulatory uptake of the work we do in park long term the objective is to develop and implement a systems-based approach to ERA. And we work uh, with both these time perspectives as we see that the small steps to update and modernize would actually be part of a long-term transition. Uh, what we do is to consider the environmental context more realistically to overcome limitation caused by the current substance-by-substance -substance paradigm and also simplified methods to speed up errors and focus evaluation efforts. We do this to be, uh, by better connecting existing uh, data resources and areas of expertise. And here collaboration across uh, disciplines and across sectors uh, are key to, uh, to address new uh, research questions where we integrate data. Uh, the, pa and the partners involved in 644 are all these, I won't go into de de detail, but we are more than 20 partners involved in this activity. It consists of five uh, different projects. And the background for these objectives is, comes very much from uh, EFSA PERA roadmap, uh, building a European partnership for a systems-based environmental risk assessment. And the, what we're trying to address is the fragmentation, the current fragmentation of data no, uh, and knowledge uh, and uh, to, to update and modernize the, the paradigm from the substance by substance to a more efficient pa a paradigm to protect biodiversity. And what we do is to improve comparability and integration of data, knowledge and expertise and improve real, uh, realism of the assessments. And here the linking of uh, measurements in the environment and prospective methods is uh, actually a, a key area which we focus on. This also helps us to find which relevant aspects of prospective assessments to focus on uh, which, uh, with the ambition to improve the relevance. And we do it, how we do it is by a systems-based approach, basically uh, in the actual work in the projects by integrate, understanding the system better, integrate and uh, collaborate across, uh, across disciplines. The, oh, here's an overview of the projects in PARC 644. We have a project called Clarifying Regulatory Needs, uh, which is an, kind of an interface, I will describe that a little bit later, uh, interface between the regulatory uh, community and the other stakeholders and the actual research projects. And then we have two parts, comparative studies where we uh, test uh, new and existing era methods with monitoring data. And uh, the other part is to develop more holistic and realistic era frameworks. These are of course interconnected uh, and also the different projects are also uh, interconnected and collaborate between them. We have a project called Exposure that tests uh, a focus initially on aquatic em environment, but the idea is to actually benchmark prospective uh, models and predictive models with uh, monitoring data. Uh, we have a project doing ha applying the same kind of approach, but for effects data. In the middle, we have a project we call Benchmark where, with the aim to, to create a an era framework that actually gives comparable results in the out, as an outcome. And to the far right, which is more to the, on the long term, we have uh, the product landscape scale where we uh, have case studies linked to them, uh, where we look at the combined impact of uh, chemicals and, uh, and other stressors in agricultural landscapes. Uh, what the improvement areas we are addressing is a strengthened feedback loop, uh, comparability of data and assessments, focus on relevant factors and aspects, and also capturing the combined impacts of PPP and other ecosystem stressors at the agro-system level, and also to improve the relevance of ERA being conducted for different decision contexts. You may have different needs if you make a decision in the field or at the regional level than at the EU level or at the national authorization level, for example. Here is uh, 
an image just of the team, of us. Uh, in the project clarifying regulatory needs, we have other participants. This, this is the lead and the, what we call the regulatory core group. And as you see, we have representatives from, from five different uh, agencies, which is a strength in, in this project as the regulatory relevance is a key. So we have this team steering a lot of the work and making sure uh, that uh, the work being done is also uh, regulatory relevant in, in dialogue with our re other regulators, of course. So we have uh, the Swiss agency, German UBA, EFSA, and also ANSES, who, we, uh, who is actually not Vanessa herself, but uh, her colleagues at ANSES are leading the entire uh, uh, park uh, partnership. And then we have the project leaders here for the other, uh, for the four research projects. In the exposure projects, we are uh, shifting uh, uh, the project leaders. Uh, we are in year three now, uh, where uh, Matthias Liss has agreed to be a temporary project leader, but we are looking for to recruit another project leader. Yes, description, what are the specific topics in the projects? In exposure and effects, one aim is to actually reduce complexity of predictive methods and models while ensuring their predictive capacity. That's a, an important uh, step in being able to, to, to pave the way to, to be able to expand the, um, the scope of a regulatory era to a more uh, landscape perspective. We do it by collect and integrating existing field measurements, develop data and develop uh, predictive methods and models. In the benchmark, we develop a product, we develop an error methodology yielding comparable results that, and provide also uh, managers with an overview of relative risk levels of authorized product. Uh, James mentioned uh, risk ranking, uh, being able to say which, which uh, risks are higher than others. Uh, and the, there is a lot of data available in, uh, today, so we see that would be a possibility also to, to steer the process. Uh, the landscape uh, project, uh, there uh, we look, to, uh, look into advanced era paradigm from the single crop uh, and single chemical perspective towards a landscape-based era where we address the impact of multiple PPP applications and also other stressors. Uh, yeah, uh, and here to avoid making it too complex, we also have a link to the other products which identify the key risk drivers, and we do that in collaboration with the exposure effects and benchmark pro, uh, projects to uh, propose risk characterization tools uh, for the landscape level. The project clarifying regulatory needs. Uh, perhaps the mo uh, has a special uh, relevance for the discussion today on collaboration opportunities. In there, we uh, uh, have adopted a dialogue-based iterative knowledge building process as we see it. We, working in the project, we don't have all the answer ourselves, so we wish to engage and learn from other uh, stakeholders to update what we are doing in the projects. So we see, we have a, kind of a knowledge container, we call it. We have a, a, a deliverable and a project report where we, we, we gather uh, problem descriptions, proposed solutions, etc. Uh, and this is something that we, uh, it's not a static doc, doc, document, but something that we wish to update. So we, in the document, we have a revisited problem formulation and from there identified needs. Uh, this transforms in the first a step into uh, proposed solutions and results, and this is ongoing now in the first years of PARC, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, we see a need to revisit what we are proposing and uh, involve policymakers, regulators, scientists, uh, other stakeholders, and risk assessors to revisit again the problem uh, formulation to make sure that what we do in PARC 644 is uh, relevant for regulatory uptake. And then we, uh, after that, we see that uh, there is a possibility to, uh, of uh, regulatory uptake of tools, methods, and also recommendations for ERA guidance. And this is a process that we envision will continue throughout the lifetime of PARC. 
and it uh, will be aligned uh, in part with work package two uh, on the, the development of next generation environmental risk assessment. Uh, and this iterative process we see uh, is necessary to, uh, to uh, ensure the relevance for the end users of, of uh, tools and approaches. Uh, and the but uh, very important. This we cannot do ourselves in 644 because this the topic as such is so uh, so huge. So we see that we need to also collaborate within Park with other projects but also external projects and the, the Horizon Europe funding for biodiversity uh, last year is a great opportunity which we are discussing today. Yes, uh, to do this iterative process uh, we need, uh, this is not just meeting and talking, we have to have a, a framework for how to, to really revisit uh, the problem formulation and we we will talk about this a little bit later today, uh, but I think there's, there is a, a good uh, slogan uh, provided by the British Research Council that says that it's important to design the right things and design things right, so that you really make sure that you're uh, trying to solve the right problem. And here, uh, dialogue we see uh, to, to really frame the problem correctly is essential. Uh, Quick outline on some examples of in clarifying regulatory needs projects of interactions that we're having. Uh, last year we had several uh, forum for exchange meetings within Park where we invited both EFSA, ECA, uh, EEA in Copenhagen, and but also US EPA and several research initiatives to uh, to exchange knowledge basically where they presented their needs or their results. Uh, and the, their view of the way forward uh, and uh, from Park 644 we presented our ideas and then we had an, an, an exchange. Uh, we have uh, had quite a few of those last year uh, to kind of create a basis but this is also something that we want to uh, pursue uh, uh, as, a, as a, f a platform for dialogue actually. We have had some several workshops inside Park 644 on transitions to a systems-based era. Uh, we did a, a first update of the CRN here means uh, clarifying regulatory needs report. It's still an internal park uh, project used for dialogue for example with Web Package 2 to ensure that we are on the right track. Uh, more uh, relevant for today perhaps is the coordination me coordinator meeting uh, between uh, Park 644, CyberAct, Polynera and TerraCamp and also a project uh, called EFSA Pera which is EFSA's project to implement uh, the uh, uh, it's the implementation project basically of the EFSA Pera roadmap. Uh, just to identify all the possi possible uh, uh, synergies that we can create between the projects. So we want to go from, from kind of risk of having gaps and overlaps to really form the synergies. Uh, this, this interaction led to several follow-up interactions and that this, we see a need really to stay connected between these projects. We had a forum for exchange where CyberEC and TerraCam presented in uh, for, uh, for Park 644. We have now uh, recently conducted an online stakeholders as advertised also for this multi-stakeholder for forum and it was directed to regulatory risk assessors for uh, PPP. We ha had it before the summer and this was a joint activity between 644, CyberEC and Polynera. I will mention a little bit more about that later. And today we have the, uh, the, also a joint uh, activity between collaboration activity between CyberEC, Polymer and Park 64, uh, the multi-stakeholder forum today. Uh, we will follow up on the survey. Uh, uh, sorry, this is an, a workshop in Paris that we will have in 644, to which we will also invite other projects. It will be held in October and then we'll have a follow-up uh, uh, activity on the survey but that's also uh, only for invited uh, regulatory risk assessors to continue to discuss the results of, of the survey. That again is a, a joint activity between 644, CyberEC and Polynera. But we will see a need to uh, 
more exchange uh, to be defined between the products and with stakeholders. Uh, in Pike 644, we have also deliverables to think about uh, and that uh, we will update the clarifying regulatory needs report. And in the uh, somewhere during 2025, we will have the first official deliverable uh, outlining uh, problem description based on the knowledge gained from all the stakeholders, uh, but also some proposed ways forward. Um, the idea is to continue the dialogue uh, for year four to seven. So the survey uh, to regulatory environmental risk assessments, uh, assessors. Again, we are focusing on uh, plant protection products as a, uh, as a pilot area. The objective was to gather insights that will help uh, deepen our understanding in the products of the current methodologies in ERA for plant protection products. And this to, to support the transition towards integrative and systems-based approaches. Uh, to meet that objective, we designed a, a number of different questions that had been uh, asked, uh, <laughs> responded to uh, by the, the, uh, the regulatory risk assessors. Uh, as, and as I mentioned, it's a joint activity between the different products. Uh, we got nearly 100 respondents from an agency at the national at the, and the, at the EU level. Uh, the analysis of the results is ongoing by the projects, the different projects research teams. The follow-up workshops will be held in October, and uh, I cannot stress this enough that it is in, by invitation only. Uh, the next step and the wider dissemination will be based on the outcomes uh, of the workshops. But for those of you who are also a little bit curious about uh, uh, the objective and how we approached it, uh, what kind of questions were asked and also a flavor of what kind of answers that came, I can recommend the, the tip of the day is to go to the EFSA PERA roadmap and read section 2.2, 2.1 there where there, are all, there was a number of uh, interviews conducted during the development of the roadmap. And there you will uh, see what kind of responses were given by the interviewees in that project. I think that uh, for the time being, it can give a, uh, a good uh, flavor, as I said, to uh, of what kind of uh, information we are receiving in this survey. Yes, so by that, uh, I would like to stop for questions. Uh, this is just, uh, if you wish to come in contact with us, you can always send me an email and I will also forward to uh, relevant people within the activity. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Johan. I should that's probably very... stop sharing. Yeah, that's great. No. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we in the agenda that was just a, a overview of the uh, projects that have formed this collaborative alliance and uh, hopefully it gave you a an overview of what each project's trying to achieve and how they're going about it um, we have allocated some time for questions and answers um, so if you do have any questions you want to direct them specifically put them in the chat um, and we'll wait a few moments we're a little ahead of schedule um, but that's uh, not a problem. So maybe more time for uh, questions. But if uh, you don't have questions um, or right now, what we will do is we will probably take the break and then come back. But I will just monitor uh, the chat uh, to see if anything is coming through. Um, we will give it uh, five minutes or so if you do have questions. Otherwise, what I think we'll do is we will take the break and as we're scheduled to come back at uh, 15.50, uh, we'll take a slightly longer break. And then if you want to re please rejoin us at 15, uh, yeah, 53, uh, 3.50 uh, Central um, European Summer Time. Uh, then there'll be a, a, a further presentation by myself, um, uh, which, uh, uh, which is about the collaboration and how we a framework for collaboration that we're developing and then also um, we want to get your input on um, what works for 
everybody, uh, the stakeholders out there who are attending this webinar, what works for you in terms of forms of collaboration? Because as uh, Johan said, these are, uh, we're developing these plans. We've just formed this uh, collaborative alliance. And what we want to do is engage with other projects as well as stakeholders. And for the moment, it's been a, a selected number of stakeholders uh, that we have engaged with, um, but we want to widen that and we want to look at how best to do that and work, uh, get your input for that. But so what I will, oops, sorry, I will do is we'll continue with the program. Uh, the next uh, part of this is really to outline um, our plans for collaboration to give you an idea of a framework that we intend to be using and also to look at some of the potential opportunities um, and then get your input as well. So I will just uh, start to share my, I'll, uh, share my screen and just, just need to prepare a few things. Okay. And I'm not sure what screen you can see. But can you see my screen? Johan, I think I'll have to ask you to confirmation. I see the collaboration opportunities. It's a slide. Yep, that's and it's in presenter mode, I presume. Yeah, sorry, Johan, you're breaking up again, but never mind. Okay. Great. Uh, right. So what we want to do, what I want to do with this uh, presentation is just to give you an idea. Now, uh, the projects, we've formed this collaborative alliance. So that's between Cyberac, Polonera and um, Park. What we want to do is really start to extend these uh, collaborations and start working with other projects as well as other stakeholders. And we're uh, developing a framework to do that. And we just want to run through this and explain it a little bit uh, in this webinar here. Um, and we hope this will start to become a uh, the starting point for a dialogue uh, that we're going to have and uh, further interactions that will be arranged uh, in the um, uh, in the coming months and also in uh, 2025. So I'll just uh, I'll just uh, outline really what we uh, want to do with this uh, this part of the session is to run through the context for collaboration and then, as I mentioned already, we have a, a framework for collaboration um, that we're intending to use, and then our intention is to build bridges for collaboration. And then I'll outline potential ways for you to, uh, for people that are interested in collaborating with these projects, um, do get in touch with us and there are ways to do that. So I'll run through those. So the context, why are we uh, looking at these collaborations um, and uh, why do we feel they're important? Well, the context is there are multiple projects that are currently working towards advancing environmental risk assessment. And uh, they're all seeking not only uh, stakeholder input, they're all seeking stakeholder input, but they're also um, now starting to realize that there is a need for collaboration between these projects. And um, as I mentioned, there has been a collaborative alliance performed, uh, formed between um, three uh, EU funded projects, a Horizon Europe funded projects, Cyberac, Park and Polonera. But we're also linked with other sister projects, um, which we have had contact with and we're in close collaboration as well. So in the Polonera presentation, I mentioned that uh, Polonera is uh, linked with Wildposh, uh, Terrakem is also linked with Cyberac. Um, we have common aims and shared ambitions to provide a better understanding of uh, exposure routes and 
toxicological and ecological impacts of chemical pollution on terrestrial biodiversity and ecosystems. And they're broadly similar research areas. So as you can see here, they employ, they're looking into systems thinking and systems-based approaches. Um, uh, as I said, better understanding your exposure and impacts and new methods and tools and established co-monitoring and open data. But there are um, slight differences in the focal areas and objectives. Pollen era is primarily focused on um, pollinators and plant protection products, uh, whereas Cybrac has uh, a broader uh, outlook and is looking at a variety of chemicals in a variety of contexts. However, one of the things that we're starting to realize, there is the potential for overlaps, as well as um, a missed opportunity to fill knowledge gaps. And this is why we think it's very important to start building these collaborative alliances. Um, yeah, and it's, we have started this with uh, between Park, Cybrec and Polinera, and we're extending this also to uh, TerraCam Terra and Wild Posh. So I just move to the next slide. So um, what we have agreed, particularly with uh, the, the uh, parks, IBRAC and Polydera and Terracan, there is a commitment to unfolding closer collaboration. And uh, these are agreement between predominantly the Horizon Europe uh, projects. There is also a commitment that we should be uh, transparent about our activities. This is one of the aim of today's webinar is to let you know what activities are going on, aiming to maximize um, the impact and ensure the sustainability of results. So, and also to see how that uh, um, other projects and also uh, stakeholders can get involved. So some of the coll collaboration mechanisms that we in um, we'll be looking at joint communication activities, joint uh, data management. These are particularly between uh, Polynera and Wild Posh. These have already been uh, agreements that have been aligned and alignment of activities. And it's the alignment of activities that is uh, an important part of what we want to achieve in these collaborative um, uh, uh, um, engagements there. Um, the, the point of the engagement uh, um, we also want to extend these collaborations because there are a number of other initiatives out there. EFSA have a number of uh, projects that they are uh, supporting. There's the PARA project, which is about to start, and the ANENS uh, project as well. So uh, those are two separate projects, but we can see there are close links that can be forged with those projects. And this is something we're starting to um, explore. There are other projects that are also going ongoing. So you have the Sprint project and there's also the Biodiverse. So there, there are probably uh, quite a number of other projects that would be of interest to us and that we may need to reach out or start to involve or engage with in different um, aspects of the work that we're doing or the research we're doing. So why is there a need for collaboration? Why do we feel that there's a need? Um, Collaboration between projects need to ensure efficient use of research resources and to enhance the scientific developments uh, that we're building, um, uh, that we're working on. And what we intend by this is to have a solid foundation of the science that can then guide the developments of new tools, approaches, but also and also the advancement of environmental risk assessment. And as part of this, we believe that collaboration with stakeholders is, is needed, as I said previously, to ensure regulatory relevance and uptake of the new approaches and tools. Um, we also are conscious that there's a, uh, a conscious that there's a, a quite a large burden of repeated calls for stakeholder stakeholder engagement. And what we want to do is avoid stakeholder fatigue. So, so we feel that uh, engagement is important and this is a uh, engagement and collaboration is important. And this is uh, what we're um, looking at is we feel that it's important to have a framework for this engagement and collaboration. So I'll uh, go, go, go through this and describe this uh, framework in a little more detail. And um, with, uh, with this, 
we don't think there's any uh, need to reinvent the wheel. There are existing frameworks out there to guide us. Johan has already mentioned um, the double diamond, but I'll go into a little more detail here. Um, we'll be following this, the design thinking approach developed by the British Council. Um, it's a very well-known approach. And as Johan mentioned, it's the, called the double diamond. It's split into two parts where we employ divergent thinking to the left-hand side of the, uh, to the left-hand side of the, uh, the, the double diamond. And then it's convergent thinking. The left-hand side of the double diamond is focused on designing the, uh, designing the right uh, thing. It focuses, off, uh, um, it focuses us on explore, exploring and then redefining. Um, and on the right then, it's about designing the right things. Um, our experience is that we often start in the middle with our own clear image of what the challenge and the problem is and immediately proceed to trying to solve these and developing new uh, solutions. Um, but if we're going to collaborate across disciplines, across projects and with different stakeholders, we think it's a, a, a important and a good idea to revisit the original problem description, the original um, uh, challenge that we're facing. Um, because there may be different perspectives, different ways of looking at this challenge. And this, by revisiting collectively, it will help us to improve our collective understanding. So uh, we think that this is important to explore and tackle common issues and problems we're focusing on within each project. There are four principles here within um, uh, that are encapsulated in this double diamond approach. The first is that it's this is a design thinking, but it's a people first. In our interpretation, that is that there are people representing um, not only um, uh, both social, uh, ecological, and also the regulatory environment. So it's a, a, it's a broad representation of human environmental interests. Um, there's also a need to communicate, and uh, when we're thinking about design thinking, that's visually and inclusively. Uh, there's also it's a, a core principle here is to collaborate and co-create. And the other important aspect is that this is an iterative process. There's an iterative process within the exploration phase and also within the design phase. And this then can also have an issue of going back again. And it's really about, are we designing the right thing? And is that design that we come up with um, fulfilling the objectives um, that we originally set? And this iterative phase is also about testing and reviewing and going back over, these, uh, over this process. So it is an iterative process. This also means that there, hopefully, what we intend with this is these are not large steps. There are small steps that are continuously be taken to improve from where we are now within the current framework to uh, hopefully transitioning towards a uh, what we're terming a systems-based um, environmental risk assessment. Yeah, so um, the process of exploring uh, Sorry, I'll just um, the, in the process of exploring uh, this issue more deeply, widely. Uh, I'll move on to the next one. The, sorry, what we want to do is uh, look at this uh, first. The important part is this left-hand um, uh, part of the triangle, and this is where we want to focus for the first part. And this is part of what we're looking at now. And for some reason, I can't get my slide to move forward, but I will just try to rectify this. No, I don't want to do that. Uh, also, James, just for you to know, I was able to find the questions in the question panel that is um, not public, rather. So I put them all in the chat and uh, Natasha is also aware. Okay, that's great. Thank you. I'm just trying to, uh, for some reason, my system seems to have frozen and I can't move forward. Okay, have we gone on to the next? Yes. Okay, that's great. Uh, the first uh, vital step is this left-hand part of the diamond, requiring us to explore and visit and align where we're coming from to have a common understanding of the challenges. 
And uh, this is what we feel is an important part of this process of collaboration engagement. Um, to look at what are the existing assumptions do we have that underline the current ERA processes and do these assumptions differ and change when we reframe the problem. Um, designing the right thing, we can then move forward to designing things right. However, it's, as I said, it's meant to be an iterative process. Uh, transition isn't a linear process. It often tells making small and iterative advances and testing at key stages. So um, we think this is a stepwise process and it is an important uh, to consider it in this way. There's not gonna be um, uh, huge advances made immediately. There should be, um, to ensure that there's positive and beneficial changes. Uh, sorry, uh, we expect that there's to be uh, tangible steps and these should be broken down into short and uh, short-term positive gains. Um, this will help us ensure that there are positive and beneficial changes that are relevant and can be taken up in the regulatory environment. Um, and this, as part of um, the double diamond approach, requires two aspects that have been added more recently to the double diamond approach by the Dome, and that is engagement and leadership. And we think those are also uh, important part aspects of uh, this framework. So building bridges. Uh, this is about uh, how we, in, uh, what we're doing to um, develop these uh, sectoral collaborations to better protect the environment. And uh, just to give you a bit of background, um, there's a growing body of scientific literature that stresses the need to advance environmental uh, uh, risk assessments, uh, whether that be the uh, methodologies or the regulatory framework. And this, uh, as you see here in a number of uh, publications here, the focus has been particularly on uh, plant protection products, pesticides. And, uh, but these changes are needed to ensure that there is a sustainable food production system that better protects biodiversity whilst ensuring a healthy food production. And um, it's uh, really positive that uh, the European Commission, ESA and ECHA are actually responding and backing various projects and working groups that are focusing on ways to advance ERA. So um, the, the projects that I've just mentioned that ESA have another a number of um, projects that they're supporting, as well as uh, the Horizon Europe ones with Cybrac and Park and Polonira and also um, uh, uh, Terrachem and uh, uh, Wildcross. So these are all, uh, all projects that are part of this movement for change. And we think now is a, a, a very opportune moment to really um, to revisit some of the, uh, the challenge or revisit the challenge that we are. And it's a very complex challenge and we can only uh, advance this by collaborations. One of the key uh, issues um, that has been also highlighted in, the, uh, uh, in some of the scientific um, uh, literature is that there's uh, considerable advances, there has been considerable advances in our scientific methods and knowledge and improved understanding. However, as uh, this, um, these developments and advances in knowledge are siloed and they're a fragmentation of the data and knowledge and expertise. And these uh, are somewhat of a hindrance and can limit the transition to a systems-based ERA. Um, uh, these are some quotes here from uh, some of the uh, uh, recent papers that have been published. So chemical pollution research is prolific but siloed. And uh, these are, I think, uh, worth bearing in mind um, for, uh, uh, or for part of, uh, the challenge that we face is this fragmentation of knowledge and expertise. And uh, this also comes from another uh, a recent paper, um, which was again looking at uh, how the transition to a systems-based approach for environmental risk assessment. And again, it highlighted the fragmentation of knowledge and siloed, and, uh, siloed assessments. And that's something that um, Nico mentioned earlier. And if we want to uh, uh, move to a systems-based ERA. So there are a number of uh, areas uh, in terms of knowledge building uh, to improve our uh, systems understanding. We need to understand the ecological context, the landscape context, and also management policy. Um, and there is a, a need to uh, have collaboration to compare and uh, uh, to 
in, uh, have compare and interconnect the results. Um, this will then, uh, by having this uh, integration of data and knowledge, they will allow us this uh, comparability. And also this will help improve the realism of assessments and focus on relevant aspects at the right level to advance the ERI, ERI methodology. Johan mentioned there are a number of, or uh, Nico mentioned, there are a number of common themes that are linking these research projects. And these are areas that we will like to explore and we will be exploring. So critical terms, what does systems-based ERA mean? Um, what does resilience mean? Th these are very important that we um, actually outline and define these and that there's common uh, understanding of what these mean in different decision contexts. And these different decision contexts can range from uh, the decisions that farmers are using for uh, um, for you when decisions are making, farmers are making when they're um, uh, looking to use plant protection products, right up to EU where they're looking to approve the active substances. So we need to understand these decision contexts and this is part of the work that we'll be doing within these projects and also to understand the underlying uh, risk drivers as well. Uh, as I identicate, uh, as I uh, mentioned in the previous slide, there are multiple contexts where decisions are made. These decisions influence the use and impact of chemicals. And this side, uh, the focus is on plant protection products. Um, and as you'll see, the decision contexts range from uh, approval uh, of active substances uh, um, at uh, the EU level, um, and that's then, but right the way down through to the farm level where there is, uh, farmers are selecting which uh, plant protection products they use, at what time, and these are all decision contexts that we, uh, we believe are important to fully understand and better understand um, so that we can uh, link these decisions and ensure that uh, they're not synergistic and don't lead to unintended consequences that have a harmful impact on the environment as well as food production. Um, we believe the aims of our projects is to advance the ERA so it's more strongly rooted in reality, as well as fostering innovation for new uh, sustainable solutions, uh, providing, by providing more accurate knowledge on ecological impacts and uh, different practices. And this requires this understanding of these different decision contexts um, as well. So uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on uh, how we're achieving this within the CyberAct project. Nico mentioned that there, there were case studies. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do is uh, within CyberAct is uh, collaborations at multiple levels, engagement at multiple levels to better understand the issues and engage stakeholders within these different levels of decision contexts. And so this summer that we held several workshops related to the case studies. And these are uh, just two um, examples of the case studies there. Uh, they were re had regional and local stakeholders uh, input to explore uh, the, uh, the left-hand part of the double diamonds, focusing on the focal problem for the challenges that they're firming, uh, facing in their own case studies. And here, the case studies here were in Spain um, uh, with uh, a number of stakeholders you can see here, and also at Hope Farm, one of the case studies that uh, Nico mentioned in the UK, where we had participation from the farm and also from the RSPB and also um, our partners there in the UK. So uh, there are a variety of stakeholders uh, spanning different stakeholder interests um, from farmers, uh, farm and farming representatives, national authorities, and also NGOs. Um, so these were our first uh, step within the CyberAct project to try to span this um, multi, uh, this, the different decision context that we're, we're wanting to look at. Uh, but we're also wanting to engage at an international level, linking EU as well as national stakeholders. So within the CyberAC, uh, um, within CyberAC, Nico mentioned we're building a forum uh, for, for dialogue uh, with planned activities. This webinar is the first one that we've planned. So there are going to be a webinars, workshops and interviews as well. So uh, in engagement in a variety of different uh, methods and different formats. Um, however, we are very conscious there are a plethora of events and engagement activities that are ongoing throughout the year because of 
well, well uh, as a result of these interest and these projects that are going uh, that are taking place currently. Um, so uh, we can see here that um, also uh, EFSA and ECA have their own platforms for engagement. And what we want to do is to uh, link these and cooperate with these um, uh, initiatives to ensure that we have this so that we can ensure efficient use of resources and time and avoid these overlaps and uh, overburdening stakeholders uh, when we're looking, seeking for their input as well. And we also help by doing this, it'll help fill, uh, prevent, uh, well, help us fulfill knowledge gaps as well as um, uh, prevent overlaps as well. However, um, uh, not all of these events are open and a lot are uh, by invitation. Um, what we want to uh, do is, uh, the part of what we're trying to achieve is that we'd like to have as open as possible, as close as necessary. There are times where we need to create safe spaces for constructive dialogue, but there are also times where we want to be open about what we're doing, transparent about the activities and the results that are coming, um, uh, coming out of the projects. Um, we, uh, there is a plan to uh, um, formal, formalize the publicity of various uh, engagement activities, primarily through PART, um, where then uh, people that are interested not only in park activities, but also in cyber activities and pollinator activities and our other projects can see these. They'll also be available on the res respective projects websites, but there is this, uh, uh, we want to formalize this so that it can be more transparent. Park has a, a, a uniting aspect here in this, uh, in this sphere and helping the projects uh, collaborate and um, uh, uh, advance ERA in, in different ways. So uh, yeah, uh, just to summarize uh, um, on how we see collaboration, Nico mentioned right at the start of this, we believe there is a need to, for collaboration to tackle this complex challenge. Uh, we've, inf well, we've formed a collaboration, a collaborative alliance between PARC, CyberAC, and Polynera because our projects have common aims, um, albeit with different approaches and different specific uh, scientific objectives, but we're all working to advance ERA, as well as several other projects as well. Um, we want to extend our collaborations, linking in line with other projects and engaging a broader set of stakeholders, getting the right people together at key points in project developments. And we believe that these, um, uh, these this collaboration uh, these collaborations can help us uh, align activities, benefit from synergies, linking the expertise and knowledge, ensure sufficient use of our research resources, and also improve the visibility and enhance the impact. And by doing this, we think then collectively we can ensure the regulatory relevance and uptake of, uh, of our new approaches. Um, so uh, this leads to the call for our desire to extend these collaborative efforts. Um, uh, Johan mentioned some of the activities that are ongoing um, within PARC. We are also uh, within CYBRAC and Polynera are planning additional uh, workshops and webinars. These are still in the uh, uh, planning phase, but they will be taking place um, in the coming months and throughout 2025. We have a set number of um, activities that we're committed to, particularly um, uh, engagement activities. And uh, this is uh, something that we will be um, uh, working on and setting out and inviting people to join in the coming months. Um, so please uh, keep a lookout on our website, um, on our project websites. Uh, if you're interested, sign up for the newsletters. You can also register to get involved. Um, on the CyberAct website, you can uh, you visit the CyberAct website and there's a, a web page where you can sign up as a stakeholder. Um, uh, this, uh, these details, uh, there's obviously we're, um, we'll be um, ensuring that uh, um, when you sign up, uh, you'll be getting either information from CyberAg, um, uh in preferred formats, but we'll, uh, you'll see there's a privacy policy essentially uh, there, but we're keeping your contact details private, but uh, it's just to, so that you can be aware that we do, re do respect there is a privacy policy which you can look at. Um, 
However, uh, yeah, so we want to know what also works best for you because there are lots of different ways that we can uh, engage with a variety of uh, stakeholders and there are uh, different methods there. So what we're designed now is for the next segment of this uh, session is uh, and a number of Mentimeter polls. So I will stop sharing my presentation and then we'll upload the, the thing. And this is one of the interactive elements of this, uh, this session here. So we'd like you to participate in the Mentimeter poll. Uh, we want your input to see what uh, could work for you, what might be the uh, mechanisms that we could employ to engage uh, different groups of people. And so I will stop sharing for the moment and then and we will uh, put up a Mentimeter slide. Um, so we have the um, questions sorted by topics uh, by Natasha now. So I'm not sure maybe also if, if it would make sense to answer the questions first and then do the Mentimeter or whichever. Um, yeah, that's fine. Better. Yeah, that would be great. Sorry, I can't uh, see any of the questions. So I will let one of you, and has my have I stopped sharing? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so the first block of questions is cyber reg related questions. Um, I'll read the first one to both of you and you'll see who, whoever can respond. How do you choose focal species, exposure, exposure pathway, standard method availability, indicator species, impact on biodiversity and ecosystem services, objective from a, reg a regulatory perspective, are we measuring the right things when assessing hazards? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, what focal species to look at? Um, I know that this isn't my area of expertise, but um, they've been looking at the vulnerability perspective um, for, for that and seeing what species are considered uh, most vulnerable. Uh, to the impacts of pesticides. But there's been considerable dialogue with Wild Posh about this. Um, if you want to know more, I can direct you to the um, work package leader for that, um, because it is, a, uh, it is something that's been in considerable discussion about what species are we selecting. And so I know there's been an ongoing dialogue between Wild Posh and um, Polynera for that, because um, what we don't want to do is we want to, we're, we're looking at slightly different species in different ways. So I think this is, um, uh, yeah, uh, an area, I can't give you an exact answer on that, but I can point you in the right direction. So if you want to send an email uh, to me, please do, and then I can uh, forward that to the relevant work package leader. Uh, Johan, you may have something to add as well. Yeah, I, I wonder, Catherine, if this was also not you. You speak about pollen error, right, James? Is that yeah, in that that respect, I'm speaking about yeah. pollen error. I think it was uh, is that the question by Annie uh, to Cyberac that we are talking about the focal species. If so, I think uh, I am not also the right person to answer specifically because we have work package leaders for. Uh, uh, other work package leaders know more about it, but uh, my understanding is that it is a little bit driven by also uh, with uh, the context of the different uh, case studies, but it, it should also be linked to the overall approach also to find uh, the key risk drivers. So uh, it's a work that I see would be sh shaped along the way, uh, actually, uh, and improved. But exactly which ones I, we would need to come back uh, about that. Okay, thank you. Um, Catherine, unfortunately, I still can't see the questions, but uh, if you can. So the next maybe... one is also about CyberRack, and it's uh, is CyberRack linked with EFSA project EU environmental scenarios for era of NTOs, EESE? A uh, question by Sonia Prag. There um, again, uh, I think we, <laughs> uh, I would not need to consult Louise, but we're certainly aware of it. Uh, 
Uh, and from Parkside, I, I uh, would see that this is a resource that we may uh, wish to connect to at a later stage from, uh, for example, the exposure uh, product side. Okay, then the next question is about Polynera and it is, will Polynera also consider plant protection products with a physical mode of action? Uh, the meaning insecticides aiming to kill pests by trapping or suffocation, or products with oily co-formulants, co uh, questioned by Rachel Sharp. Now that is a very good question. Um, I can't answer that at the moment, I'm afraid, but I will direct that to the relevant work package leader. Um, so all these questions, they're really useful. They will help us um, uh, sharpen our focus. Um, we may not be able to answer now, but we will put you in touch. So, uh, uh, Rachel, I will put you in touch with the relevant work package leaders there for that. Then there's a question generally about the projects. Um, it says GD developments and EFSA involvement from Christoph ben uh, Brenzinger. And this next one is um, probably related to this. How will the projects be part of all the upcoming new GD, meaning EFSA mandated soil organisms, NTAs, NTTPs, indirect effects on biodiversity, meaning the new BGD? So these are the guidance documents, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we can only uh, respond from the project side. I mean, uh, it is not the projects that are responsible for the process, but I can say that we, uh, from park side, liaise as much as possible with the needs from EFSA at different levels. We have representatives at high level participating in the in the shaping of park, uh, actually, and. Uh, uh, specifically, we're not involved, to my knowledge, in the development of, of specific guidances, uh, but the, the concepts and the knowledge building we are creating here may be uh, useful in the development of the guidance. But this, I think, is m uh, something that we would need to answer uh, in concert with, with representatives from EFSA. Uh, we Again, do have uh, uh, several different uh, meetings, actually, uh, uh, in, in various levels with EFSA to approach this. It, it's, it takes a little bit of time to find the, the, the format and the framework for collaboration in so many different uh, levels and with so much information and so many projects, actually. Yeah, I'd agree, Johan. Um, again, from uh, Polinera and Cybrac point of view, again, uh, we're not directly involved in the guidance documents, but we hope our work will complement that, provide knowledge building for that as well. And again, we are reaching out to EFSA and colleagues there um, to have this dialogue to uh, see uh, that we can feed in our uh, the knowledge that we're building, developing the tools so that they are relevant and they uh, may be incorporated in part of the guidelines in some future point in time. But uh, the, the, these projects are separate to the guidelines. Sorry, there's another one uh, about the guidelines, uh, guidance documents. Probably it's uh, you've un already answered it, but I'll read it anyways, just to be sure. Are you planning to combine all guidance documents for all traffic levels into one big risk assessment scheme? Well, again, I think that <laughs> uh, the projects are not responsible for that, but I, I think from the themes that you've heard, uh, you see that we're exploring ways of integrating data. So exactly how the scheme would look like is maybe another question, but the need to integrate uh, the uh, ecological impact of, of pesticide use and across different organisms groups would uh, certainly be a, a relevant uh, thing to to look at and uh, see if we can learn something. So, But if that then transforms to a big scheme for all trophic levels that uh, we cannot say at this stage, but a, a movement in that direction is certainly something that is being explored in the projects. Then we have one. Um that just came in and it's from uh, Reina Iseme. 
Thanks a lot for the great presentations, very informative, very happy to see the focus on collaboration. This is essential for success. How do you envisage to increase your cooperation with the plant protection product industry? How can the plant protection industry contribute with its data and expertise to this dialogue? Uh, that's a very good question. And this is something um, primarily when the projects, their focus has uh, initially been on involvement of uh, the academia and uh, the regulatory, uh, bridging the link between academic uh, scientists and regulatory scientists. However, uh, we do see a need to involve um, uh, the plant protection product industry. Uh, they are an important stakeholder in all of this and uh, they're a, the end user. Um, they provide a, they do provide a lot of data. So this is something we're actively uh, now considering and looking at and that we do have some plans, but this is all part of the, the next part of the session is to uh, see uh, what mechanisms work for um, the plant protection industry. They're involved in all forums already with EFSA as well in their stakeholder forum um, is how can some of the projects that we're working on uh, feed in um, to existing platforms, so we don't have this uh, stakeholder burden, uh, stakeholder fatigue, um, but also maybe there are certain um, aspects where we reach out to uh, selected indiv individuals uh, within the industry to get their input. But this is something we're actively now considering at the moment. So we do think that there is a need for this. Clearly there is. Um, our focus hasn't been on it hasn't been on this uh, engagement just yet, but there definitely is in the coming months and years ahead, a need for this. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, we have another question that just came in, which is probably to both Polinera and Park uh, by Vanessa Rüben, which is population TKTD and landscape modeling seems to play a crucial role in the Polinera project. Will those state-of-the-art approaches also be applied within the park project? Uh, I cannot answer uh, directly on that, but it's certainly something uh, that we will uh, we are exploring the possibility to somehow. I, I, I guess you are thinking uh, specifically of Alma's modeling, for example. In park, we are. Uh, benchmarking different approaches of uh, uh, assessing impacts, so certainly ALMAS uh, could be uh, such uh, an approach to to look at in certain contexts in, in part, but that for the moment we don't have any concrete plans. Okay, that's all the questions I have received for the moment. Uh... If people do have further questions, uh, go on. Yeah. Sorry, Johan. So, yeah, sorry. I just see that the yeah, TKTD we are actually uh, looking at in one of the projects, though, I should say. And there also some landscape modeling, but uh, Almas is not linked uh, for the moment. If there are further Partly, questions, yes. uh, do feel free to get in touch with either Johan or myself. We um, may not have the answers ourselves, but we are very happy to forward them and then um, uh, to colleagues within the various projects that we're collaborating with to make sure yeah. they do get answered. Some of the questions are very, I mean, it, they are obviously posed by people who know quite a lot about the, the, the system and we have to rely also on all the expertise we have in the projects. I, I don't know everything I have in, in my head here. So, so please feel free and reach out. We have a good resources in the projects. Okay, if we are, are on time, no more, I think. Yeah, if there are no more questions, and what we'll do is we'll do this Mentimeter. We hope um, this is a webinar. Uh, unfortunately, it, uh, there are very few opportunities for interactive elements, no able to raise your hand or ask a, a question face to face. It just has a uh, thing, but this is a format um, that we uh, have selected. But we do have a Mentimeter, so I'll ask my colleague Natasha to share her slides. And then we hope you'll participate. Uh, this is uh, one way that we want to get your input and we'll then use this input to start to develop our um, uh, engagement activities and plan those activities as well as seeing 
uh, how we can collaborate further in the future. So I said, this is one of a number of uh, uh, initiatives and activities we'll be carrying out. But the key thing will be to coordinate. So there isn't, uh, yeah, our diaries are all very busy and um, it, there's a, a plethora of events. So we want to see where we can find synergies and, uh, and uh, align either events or um, existing platforms that are out there. So as a stakeholder forum or other meetings that they arrange. So I don't know if Tatasha is able to share her screen. We may have a slight technical issue. Okay, I think it should be possible now. Uh, that's a PhD plan. Need to change screens, Natasha. <laughs> I should stop sharing for the moment. Oh, well, well. We still have your. PhD plan up there. Uh, I will Okay, uh, Johan, I will just go and she's not too far away. I'll just go and see if I can uh, that's it. Okay. So for everybody that those that are still with us, uh, we'd be very grateful if you it wouldn't take too long. It's a very simple Mentimeter. Or just use either QR code. You should be able to use your mobile phone, or if you if you're on a uh, laptop PC at your desktop, uh, you can go to Mentimeter.com and then enter that code, um, and then we will start. Uh, the questions there. There are not many. I think there are only uh, five or six questions, uh, short, but hopefully it's uh, the one chance to interact uh, within this webinar. So uh, we look forward to your answers. I think, Natasha, if you can uh, leave that up there for a little longer. Uh, we'll post the, uh, the code in the chat as well. So I'll just Okay, so quite a few of you joining in there. I'll ask Catherine to post the uh, the code in the chat. Uh, I did. It should be there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, I think you need to post the code as well. Um, so, Natasha, do you want to go ahead with the first question? So what we'd like you to do just as a, a warm up is to vote for three themes uh, that you find most relevant. And uh, we have listed a number of themes here that we think are uh, important. Uh, you each get three votes. So um, when you see, you can select those, you can either put them all your three votes on one uh, aspect or you can put them on, you can divide them evenly. So uh, please go ahead and vote on this uh, question.
Great, that's, uh, I will give you a little bit more time for people to look at the different categories here. We can see there's a, a clear uh, theme that is uh, obviously of considerable importance for most people here and interlinking prospective and retrospective ERA. Um, yeah, we would agree with that and think that's an important aspect as well. Uh, that's why in the Polonera uh, project, there is a, a considerable focus on uh, developing this co-monitoring scheme, for, not only for uh, pollinators, but also for pesticides as well. We will also be uh, look at these, your insights here to help us think about what themes we can reach out about what are what do people see as the burning issues or the burning challenges here. So uh, this will help us steer our engagement activities as well. Uh, Natasha, do you want to go to the next question? I think we have reached uh, uh, the, yeah, reach saturation with responses there. So in your view, what changes, if any, do you see as necessary or beneficial to advance ERA? So this is a free format. Um, we'll give you a few minutes to type in your answers. Um, it, it could be a, a long and as short as you want, but uh, um, I think there is a limitation of 200 characters, but uh, um, just a, a, a few, a couple of sentences. This is what we would be useful to just get a little feedback on. So we'll give you some time to consider your thoughts. Uh, these are great, great suggestions and great comments. It, it seems these comments are also um, align with a lot of what the projects are trying to achieve. Some are uh, maybe uh, Okay, these are very useful. Again, um, I can see uh, there are more coming in. Uh, we'll be uh, looking at these, reviewing these. Uh, these are, just to let you know, these are anonymous responses. So we don't know uh, who has posted them, um, but they are very useful to get, uh, for us to gain an insight in what you think are some of the uh, key challenges there. Oh. And I, I think, Natasha, uh, people can vote for some of these. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think that was the voting part where you can say, OK, I also yeah. agree with this one. Uh, let's give it your voice. Yep. It's maybe a little bit closer to question. It seems uh, Natasha, sorry, I can't hear you properly. So they found nine groups. Okay. Uh, can you scroll up a little bit, Natasha? I think. Yeah, let's see. So it's grouping the responses.
Um, what we all do, we'll also do is we will share these as well. Um, they are anonymous, so um, this isn't a so that there's no linkage back to anybody that's participating now. But I think what we'll do is there are some very interesting comments here and we'll share these so that everybody can see those. So everybody that's participated can see these. We will share these after the webinar. Okay, in a short period of time, I can see you've been very active. And that is, Okay, uh, I think, have you enabled voting yet, Natasha? Uh, there are a lot there of responses. I think we will try to have a voting. So if the, all the responses are there, you can now vote for these to see which you agree with. Um, Again, I think you will you should be given three votes, which you can put on one comment or another, um, or you can divide them equally between your votes equally between three different comments. Uh, we may need to monitor to the chat. Is the voting working for people? I'm not sure. If I don't know if, if anybody participating can let us know if the voting's working. Um, so people are typing in the questions box that it's not working and I also opened the link. I also can't choose anything. Okay. For no, then we won't. We will, we'll move on to the next question then. Oh, we'll move on to the next question. Now I can see the voting options. Is, do we still want to do that? Uh, yes, if you can see the voting options now, that would be great. Uh, I'm not sure if people, yeah. Okay, looks good now because we can see five people have voted, so seems to work. So we'll give people a bit of time to do this. Because I saw there are a lot of comments there.
Yes, I uh, I have seen a a comment in the question box. Uh, not sure whether anonymous answers uh, will enable these questions to be very helpful. Uh, yes, it would be very nice to have background, but um, uh, information on who's completing what or who said what. But uh, Mentimeter uh, isn't a a uh, survey system really it's uh, just a polling system so it would have been very helpful but this gives us a feel for the pers different perspectives that people might have um, and what the sort of uh, various views are out there so I, I do agree it would be more useful um, to have yeah, an idea of the background of different people but uh, we have selected Mentimeter to do this and we still think it's a useful to have a anonymous um, information this way it looks like everybody's voted okay so in the short space of time yeah landscape approaches so that's obviously quite a coup one substance one assessment yes uh, very uh, important uh, aspect that is under consideration Okay, uh, we'll move on to the next question. We will share these uh, slides so you will get to see. Um, this next is just a, a, a comment that was uh, actually came from the um, risk assessor survey, and uh, it really sums up, uh, in our view, why that there is a, a movement that thinks that collaboration could really benefit uh, advancing environmental risk assessment. Um, so uh, yeah, this is uh, just a quote we want to do that because the next set of questions are about collaboration. So uh, uh, we just wanted to get your input on what do you think are the most uh, three most important factors for effective collaboration, in your opinion. And um, again, you'll have three votes. You can distribute them evenly or put them all onto one category. Um, so uh, we'd be grateful if you could start allocating your votes. Okay, I think we've gained everybody's responses. Great, this is really interesting. There's some interesting things that this is something that I'll just pick on transparency. Again, this is something that uh, we believe is important. Uh, in Polynera, there's open science, the same is for Cybrac as well. But it's also about transparency of the activities that we're doing, as well as the outcomes as well. And this then leads to you know, being inclusive with diverse perspectives and also clear communication. So uh, these are, yeah, it's great to see there's um, uh, clustering around certain key themes that are considered important for collaboration. One surprise is there's no votes for strong leadership, but that, uh, that's um, it's not a bad thing. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Thank you very much. So what format uh, for collaborations would you we find beneficial for development of environmental? There are lots of different formats there. We, we, we can employ different methods. Um, some are well-established. Um, they also have the forum for knowledge exchange or uh, those type of things. But um, yeah, we would like your input to see uh, what you think might be what uh, 
types of methodologies are, are beneficial. It could be either collaborative platforms and tools. These aren't mainly online um, working groups or these uh, workshops or open webinar events, which tend to be for more information um, rather than actual dialogue. Um, or maybe you don't even see there's a need for collaboration, but I get the feeling that most people do think there's a need for collaboration that are attending now. Working groups. Yeah. Clear winner. Targeted working groups. Yeah. Okay, well, there is a clear winner here. So this is something we will uh, consider and bear in mind when we're looking for engagement activities about particularly related to some of the work packages within Cybrac and Polynera and also in Park that uh, we're able to have uh, working groups um, also that are inclusive of different diverse perspectives. So this might be an important aspect that we need to consider. I think that's for the voting. If you have any, yeah, this is an open question. If you have other formats, uh, please share them. And this is the uh, penultimate question, I think. I'll give you a few minutes to answer this. Mm -hmm. Solutions data sharing and access. Uh, that's uh, another good comment. I understand that's also part of uh, an EFSA backed project um, called PERA. Uh, there, there, that will be considered within that project as well. Yeah. Combined Regulatory Risk Assessment Forum. That was interesting. Yes, I saw that. none. <laughs> okay, I think we will uh, move on. Um, I agree. Uh, discussion groups with mismanagers and policymakers would be very beneficial. Uh, it's uh, uh, a, a tricky. Uh, there are uh, <laughs> hack events. Ah. Wow. Okay. Okay, uh, we are nearly coming to time anyway, so I think we should uh, wrap up soon. And uh, what topic or theme would you be interested in involved in? Again, Is Natasha, do we have categories for this is open ended? I think this is open ended. Uh, risk mitigation.
Mm. Yes, okay. These are very good suggestions. So it's quite a, a lot of interest in different nice. aspects, uh, particularly I can see here uh, how decisions are made and ensuring, uh, uh, just seeing recommendations, uh, ensuring recommendations can lead to regular decisions. So a, a lot is related to how the decisions are made and the processes for that to ensure that they are that, for instance, uh, have scientific uh, basis. And that's a uh, sort of positive uh, responses here. Okay, Natasha, I think we should just uh, move forward. Yeah, uh, we mentioned a number of projects uh, that we're aware of already and that we're already uh, building uh, or forming links with, but are there other projects on this that might be relevant for us to interact with? Um, yeah, there seems to be quite a lot of activity in this area. And I think it's, uh, we just want to see if there are ones that we, uh, that aren't on our radar and that we think, well, actually there should be, and we should be uh, in at least linking and seeing how we can, um, uh, benefit from any synergies between the work that's been done in different projects. So if you have any suggestions, please write them here. We'd be grateful. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there may be industry projects that we're not aware of. So I, I don't know what projects they have ongoing. I haven't heard of these, but we will look them up and see. Uh, how we can best incorporate them, or at least reach out to them, link up if if we uh, if we can find if we think we can form some synergies in the work that we're doing. Hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Yes. Yeah, the representative bodies of various interests you would be uh, uh, useful to reach out to, we agree. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to get any more responses, but if you, if people that are still attending and think of something they'd like to, uh, think there are projects out there or even uh, stakeholders that uh, think should be uh, contacted, please get in touch with either myself or Johan. Um,
So we'll just leave this uh, last one here for a moment. I think, uh, well, this is the last question, isn't it, Natasha? Yes. Um, okay, great. Uh, we are coming to the close of the webinar. Um, I think uh, Nico, unfortunately, wasn't able to stay with us the whole time. So I, there are no real words uh, to wrap up. But what I will do is, on his behalf, thank everybody that has attended today. And we are very grateful for you to join us. This is the start of a journey um, where we are seeking collaborative opportunities and wanting to engage uh, with other projects and also with stakeholders. And over the coming months, um, a number of us will be working uh, together to develop, strengthen these collabor collaborations and also to explore new opportunities. Um, please do uh, remember that you can uh, on the Cybrac website, you can register as a stakeholder um, and uh, we'll then keep you informed of developments of the Cybrac project. It's also the same on the Polonera as well. Um, so you can sign up for newsletters and just uh, keep a looking at the websites to find out information. But in those that are interested um, and want to take part in other events, we will uh, inform you of those. and. Uh, taking your feedback here and looking at working groups, we'll see how we can set some of these up within the projects and how they may benefit our engagement activities and also how they may um, help uh, steer the work and the research that we're doing within the various projects. So thank you very much for attending. I will say we will uh, uh, close the webinar for now and uh, say uh, we hope to see you another time. Um, at a, another event, either face-to-face -face or online. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.